Let's pray. Grab your Bibles real quick and go to John. Um, I just want to share my heart on this text. And I'm trusting that you had been with us throughout this series that we've been doing on, um, um, you know, resolving to change. Um, I'm almost at the end of it, but I want to do something this morning that I need to kind of share with you. I need you all to hear what I'm going to share this morning. So bow your heads with me. Let's pray. And then we're going to read, and then we're going to, well, let's read first. Go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. I'm going to go to a very, very familiar passage of Scripture that I want to read with you. And then I'm going to point um, three things from the text that I'm hoping will begin the process of changing our lives so that God could move and have his way in our midst. The book of St. John chapter 3. Wednesday, you were instructed to read this, so hopefully in your research and study, we can synchronize thought processes today, and God would move and have his way. Amen. If you're there, say amen. amen. Verse 1. I'm going to read verse 1 through uh, 4, 15, and then we'll just talk through it. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a rule of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Let me replace that uh, male pronoun to them, okay? Verse 3, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, or verily, verily, depending on your translation, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Um, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Before I even read, the Lord just dropped this in my spirit. A lot of us are asking the same question. How can I change? I've been doing this a long time. I'm old. You kind of get what I'm saying? Uh, what am I supposed to do? Verse 4, um, verse 5, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, Lord have mercy, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel um, that I say to you, you must be born again. Verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. That's a profound statement. Yeah, verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered them, come on, dude, you, you ordained preacher. Um, he's supposed to know this. You're a teacher of the gospel, and yet you do not understand these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Verse 13, he says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven that the Son of Man, in verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's like a whole Old Testament review there. Verse 15, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Let us pray, and then we're going to walk through this. God, we bless you. As I share the third part in this series, Lord, I'm praying that we will be, won't be like Nicodemus, and the Pharisees, Sadducees for that matter, but we would hear um, and accept what you're saying. So open our hearts to the word. We shared a lot up until this point in the year. So God, have your way in our lives. Open our hearts to receive that we may be all you would have us to be. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. 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 Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, resolve to change. Okay, now while you're looking at them, tell them this. So you cannot stay where you are and go with God. Turn to the other person. Say, other person, you cannot stay where you are and go with God. Amen. Now, I just want to, I want to share some things on this morning to kind of get you to where we need to go. Um, this is the third, if you've been here all three weeks, this is the third in three, um, and a teaching on resolve to change that I've shared with you thus far. So far, you've heard of two individuals. Um, the first guy was the guy in John chapter 5 that was the invalid by the pool of Bethesda. And you know his story if you hadn't listened to the series, go on podcasts and download it and get it. But here was his situation. This man um, 
was, was invalid, laying by the pool, and the story was once in the right season, an angel will come down and trouble the water, and whoever gets in the water first, they would be healed, okay? Jesus shows up on, shows up on the scene and says to him, do you want to be healed? And I was sharing with the brothers a little bit about the excuses we made. It's almost as if, if he were in urban Aurora, he'd say to Jesus, what had happened was, you know, <laughs> I was hoping to get in, but somebody, come on, y'all know this. He made excuses for his situation versus responding to Jesus. If, you know, if you ask me if I want to be healed and I'm sick, I'm going to tell you yes. Come on, say amen. I'm going to say yes. I'm not going to have the excuses, all that good stuff. The, the, the long and short of it, Jesus says to him, take up your bed and walk. He takes up his bed. He walks. Jesus sees him in the temple later on. And then he says to him, sin no more so that nothing worse can happen to you. Now, there were three takeaways from the text that I want you all to track with me. Number one is that uh, we must be cognizant of the need to change. Say, I must recognize, I must recognize. the need to change. Okay. Secondly, I must put my problem in the context of Jesus' ability and go to Jesus. Okay. So we kind of shared those three things in various forms last week um, with the second part of the series. Last week, we kind of looked at this fellow by the name of Blind Bartimaeus. So since that is so fresh in your head, let me kind of talk about these two guys so I can talk about the third one. The first fellow, he was laying by the pool, and it was as if he was not taking the initiative to get well. You guys are getting with me. He was just laying there for to be troubled, and he had been there so long. I mean, he had his problem for 38 years. Jesus saw him sitting there, and the text says that Jesus had mercy or compassion because he had been there so long that he just basically healed him. But this guy was doing nothing to fix his problem. Okay? Very, very important. The second fella, um, blind Bartimaeus, the text says he was sitting in Jericho away from where Jesus was. And he would hear from time to time of Jesus' ability to heal. So his story was, I'm blind, I can't get to Samaria where Jesus is. I can't get to, to Galilee where Jesus is doing all the miracles. I can't get to where Jesus is. But oh, if only Jesus could come my way, I would seize the opportunity and cry out to him. You guys are tracking with me. First fellow was not doing anything to fix his problem. The second one was waiting for the right moment to seize the opportunity. Are you with me? Then the opportunity presented itself, and Jesus showed up, and here he was. Hey, hey I've been waiting too long for this, all right? So, so Jesus, y'all know this. Now, I want to look at this third fella. This third fella we're going to look at today is a guy by the name of Nicodemus, and I'm going to add this in there, and you do whatever you want to do with it. Church guy. <laughs> and, and he wasn't laying there doing nothing. He wasn't waiting for Jesus to come his way. He took the initiative to go to Jesus to get help. You can't get what I'm saying? Three types of individuals, three types of people. Now, lest you be depressed in saying, in trying to figure out which one you are, let me just say this and I'm going to walk into the text. All three of them, regardless of their mindset, still met Jesus. good news for me. Maybe it's not good news for you. Good news is this. It doesn't matter what your frame of mind is. Jesus will meet you where you are. <laughs> Come on, say amen, y'all. Are you with me? Doesn't matter their mindset. Jesus met them where they were. And, and I want to say that for, by way of good news for those of you that are here this morning, because it doesn't matter what you're going through, what your circumstance, what your predicament is right now, what you did, whether you're active, proactive, waiting for an opportunity, just laying there doing nothing. It doesn't matter where you are. He will condescend and come down to where you are to meet us. Come on, y'all. That's good news. That's good news. That's good news. For some of us, he met at the altar. Some of us, he met in the drug houses. Come on. Some of us, he met in the house we shouldn't have been in. Some of us, he met in prison. Come on, don't act like you hadn't been nowhere. Some of us, he met in the gang. But the fact is, he still showed up where we were 
to meet us. Ah, there's a resolution where God wants us to change. And sometimes he wants us to take the initiative. Sometimes it doesn't matter what we do, he's going to come anyway. That's love. <laughs> uh, come on, give me two amens, y'all. That, yeah, yeah. That's love. That's love. That's love. Now, as you move into the text, this third fellow now, by the name of Nicodemus. Come on, say Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Here's Nicodemus' predicament and Nicodemus' situation. Jesus now is on his sojourn, sojourn doing what Jesus does. And if you were back up to chapter 2, matter of fact, back up to chapter 2, let me kind of walk you through this so you can see what's going on here, and then we're going to talk through the text. And I'm going to be very, very basic this morning because my hope is that somebody not leave here the same way they came, okay? Back up to chapter 2, and if you go down to verse 13, um, well, let me just walk you through chapter 2. Go to verse 1 of chapter 2, okay? And let me know when you're there, okay? So if you notice this, what it's talking about is Jesus just completed attending the wedding um, in Cana, um, where he kind of hooked the brothers up with, you know, the good stuff. Um, yeah, and the Spirit showed up. <laughs> Some of y'all missed that. Read it when you get home. So <laughs> it was the good stuff, okay? And then on his way, he's continuing his journey. Verse 13 is very, very important, okay? It was the feast of the Passover. Let me just kind of talk you through it. And he was going up to Jerusalem. He went to the temple. I'm in mean, verse 14. He found people selling sheep and pigeons, and the money changers were sitting there. And Jesus made a whip. And he whooped that behind. Um, I mean, he went buck wild beating people for jacking up his house. Okay, I'm just paraphrasing. And he kind of says, if I may summarize this, that my father's house is going to be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Okay, so on and so forth. Now, verse 18 is important. So the Jews, come on, say the Jews, said to him, what sign do you show for us doing these things? And then he says in verse 19, come on, say signs. Says verse 19, he answered them, destroy this temple, I'm going to build it up in three days, so on and so forth, all that good stuff. Now jump down to verse 23. Look at what verse 23 says. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name, watch this now, when they saw what? The signs he was doing. Okay? So it was something about Jesus' ministry that was drawing attention to people and attracting them to, to come to or to follow him or to develop a relationship with him. So now look with me now at chapter 3, verse 1. This is where Nicodemus comes on the scene because Nicodemus, just like you and like me, were observing and wanting to know what's up with this fellow named Jesus. So let me read this and let me talk about this. Verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do, and don't miss this phrase, unless what? God is where? Oh, come on, come on. Unless what? God is where? Okay, my problem, my problem is for me to do anything, I need God with me, okay? I'm going to go ahead and say it about you so you don't think I'm just talking about me. For you to do anything, you need God with you. Let's be honest about that. Turn your neighbor and say, neighbor, if the Broncos are going to win, no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. No, 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 I'm just, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Okay. Y'all, I mess up a good message, don't I? <laughs> but just say, neighbor, you need God with you. Come on, say. Say, you need God with you. Good. <laughs> now, now watch this. Watch this. Very, very important, okay? And then look at how Jesus is respond. Verse 3, Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, let me give you a lot of information so I can be to properly exegete just two things I want to share with you in the text. Say Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Here's what you need to know. Nicodemus, the text says, was a ruler of the Jews. That meant that he was part of the Sanhedrin council. And what the Sanhedrin was, it was the dominant leadership team or the, the rulership in the Roman Empire that governed the Jews. Now, what you need to know is the Sanhedrin consisted 
of what are known as Pharisees and Sad, yeah, sad you sees. Come on, you guys are getting it. And the total um, group that comprised the, uh, the Sanhedrin council was about 70 people. Now, what you need to know about the Pharisees and the Sadducees as it relates to the text, the Pharisees didn't care about the temple cultic systems. What that meant is they didn't care about your worship service. The Pharisees didn't care about what went on in church. That was not their issue, as long as you didn't break the law. The Pharisees were the interpreters of the law. They were the, you, you would hear terms like scribes and Pharisees. Come on, y'all know this. These were the guys that were responsible to make sure that you adhere to every jot and tittle of the law. And whatever the law said, the Pharisees wanted to make sure you lived it out. So their role on the Sanhedrin was to make sure the law was adhered to. Come on, y'all talking to me. Now, here's the thing with the Sadducees. The Sadducees, they were more of the priestly tribe or Levite descent. That meant that the Sadducees were the ones responsible for the cult systems or the worship in the church. Very, very important thing. So lock into this. If you went to church and under the law you had to offer a sacrifice, you had to go see a Sadducee. Y'all just pretend y'all with me. Say amen. amen. Okay? And you had to go through these, these individuals to get your sacrifice. If you wanted prayer, it was a Sadducee. So whatever happened in the temple, it was the Sadducee people that were responsible for it. Now, if you back up to chapter 2, which we just read, lock into what just happened. Jesus just jacked up the Sadducee system. He did. He walked in the temple and he said, what in the heck? are you guys doing up in here, up in here, up in here? And he took him a whip, and he got to whoop some Sadducees behind. Come on now. And he made them really sad, you see. You come on. And he, and he, 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 was, he, 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 he was working it out. Come on. He, so, so the Sadducees had an attitude with Jesus. Pharisees, on the other hand, they're watching this go down because they're not in the temple. They didn't have nothing to do with temple. So what that did is it paved the way for a Pharisee to approach Jesus, come on, and ask him, dude, that was a whooping. How come you can do stuff like that? Now, let me help you all with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a very, very prominent Pharisee. I am led to believe, this is Felix's opinion, and I think I can kind of walk you to this in Scripture, but I'm not saying this is the law of God, that Nicodemus was the teacher in Israel. I'm going to show you this a little later in the text. So that meant, let me, let me use some, some words here for a while. If the law needed to be exegeted or to be interpreted, you went to Nicodemus. If you had a question about what the law said, you would go to the Pharisee, but he was like the head Pharisee. You kind of get what I'm saying? So here's Nicodemus' role. If you got a question, you went to him and you asked him. So Nicodemus knew everything there was to know about what the Old Testament Scripture said. So guess what he's not going to do? He's not going to show you how much he don't know by you catching him, somebody asking somebody else what Scripture really says. So what does he do? When nobody's looking, he goes to Jesus when? By night. Oh, come on, y'all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because he can't get busted because I'm supposed to know this stuff. So, so if I've got to teach it and I see some things going on that I don't know about, I want to find out about it. So listen to his dialogue with Jesus. Listen carefully. Now, Nicodemus was what? Talk to me, a what? He was a Pharisee, and what did he do? A what? Teacher of the what? Come on, say he was what? Teacher of the law. So listen to how I'm going to say this. So he goes to Jesus, and listen what he says. Hey, G, you a rabbi... I'm a rabbi. <laughs> There's a problem here. Because as a rabbi, and matter of fact, I'm over you. 
because I'm on the Sanhedrin and I am the teacher, you ain't nothing but 30. Young buck, read scripture, you ain't even went to seminary. But we got a problem because we, we know you're not trained, we know you're not learned, but yet and still, when you operate, we recognize something about you. Then listen to this. We notice that God must be with you because there's no way you can do what you're doing unless God is with you. Now, Jesus, I've been a Pharisee for a long time. And I've never done none of the stuff you did. What's going on, G? Hook a brother up. <laughs> so when I go back to the council, I can do some of the things. Come on, y'all, that, that you're doing. Now, now. Some of us have been in church a long time, and a miracle hadn't come out of us yet. <laughs> come on, come on. I mean, <laughs> you, know, you know, we, we, we haven't been able to worship God and, and do the miraculous that God, come on, around us. We pray for folk and stuff doesn't happen. We pray for ourselves and stuff doesn't happen. So what's up, right? What's up? This is Nicodemus' question to Jesus. Jesus, help me understand this because I know of all the scripture. And in the Old Testament, when I look at um, um, Ezekiel and when I look at all the prophets and when I look at David, and, and when they did something that was miraculous, we attributed it to God. And we, we've watched you long enough that we have no choice but to say God is with you. No choice. So what's up? Listen to Jesus' response. Let's read. Let's read. Verse 3. Say amen if you're there. And I'm going to be quick. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is what? Everybody said, unless he's what? He cannot what? Now let me just talk about that really quick. Number one, for us to operate in the kingdom realm as it relates to change now, we must be born again. Okay. Now, I am not making no assumptions. I'm not overlaying anything on anybody in here to say that the reason it doesn't happen is because we're not saved. I'm not saying that. I am saying this. The beginning of change in the truest sense, if we're going to resolve the change, entrance into the kingdom of God requires being born from above. I want you to hear what I'm saying. You got to give your life to Christ. In the most basic sense. Let me go here. You know, I'm going to read the rest. Number one, say, I must be born again. Say it again, I must be born again. So if I'm struggling with something for a long, 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 long time, and I can't shake it, I might want to check to see where I'm really at in my relationship with God. Okay? Here's what Jesus is trying to say, and I'm going to show you this in the second part really quick. Notice what he says. See the kingdom of God. See the kingdom of God. See the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus, you've been standing on the outside looking in, and you thought I was in the earth realm, even though I'm there physically, but spiritually I exist in the kingdom. When we look at each other as kingdom subject, even though I see you physically, your mind, grandma would say it this way, ought to be so stayed on Jesus that I can't figure out why you're not doing the worldly things that I do. And here's your response. Because I'm born again, even though I exist in the world, I don't live in the world. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. And if I'm not of it, worldly things don't influence me. But that's only possible if you're born again. Come on, Sam, must be born again. Okay, so, so Jesus is trying to draw a, li a line here, Nicodemus, to transfer from the kingdom that you're in. Because you must understand, at that point, they were still operating under the law, and Jesus came not to abolish, but to fulfill the law. Nicodemus, if you want, listen to this, God to be with you, you must be basic, okay? If you want God to be with you, you must be born again. Let me break it down even further. What that means is you must have accepted Christ in your life 
as personal Lord and Savior, and I'm going to go to the end and say this, and we must surrender to him. Come on, say amen. I just want to talk this morning. I want you all to hear me. You must, come on, say it again. Say, I must be born again. Say it again. I must be born again. So now listen to Nick. This is, that's number one. Listen to Nick number two. Okay, Jesus, you're tripping. I've lived life. I'm 90. I don't know how old he was. I'm just saying. Um, and, 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 and I'm mature. I've got kids. I mean, I've lived life. I've done all this stuff. Now you are expecting me to undo all of that stuff and re-enter my mother's womb and start over? <laughs> Here's Jesus' response. Let's read, and then I'm going to show you, okay? Nicodemus, verse 4, said to him, How can a man, when he's old, enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Here's what Jesus said. Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of what? Water. And what? And then notice the word change as opposed to see. It says enter. He cannot enter the what? Kingdom of God. Look at verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is what? Flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't be shocked or marvel that I say this unto you. You must be born again. Now, here's the thing. We're born again. A part of being born again means this, that if we're going to enter the kingdom of God, so here's the thing. I'm existing in the earth realm. Let me say it this way. Here's the earth realm. Here's the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, God is with me. I could do a whole lot of stuff. For this transition or transfer to take place, this is why Corinthians put it this way, if any person is in Christ, he's a what? New creation, the old has gone, the new has come. Listen to what God said. I must be born of the water and then what? I must be born of the water and then what? Everybody say that, come on, say it. I must be born of the water and then what? Very, very important concept, spirit, break down. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come dwell. Very, very important thing. That word water, born of the water, a lot of commentators disagree on what the term really means and why it was used in the text. And there's a plethora of of explanations on what the word really means. I land on the simple. I think Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus and reflecting back on what John was doing at the Jordan. Okay? So, so Jesus says there's a baptism that's required, not saying that you have to be baptized to be saved. I am not saying that, and Jesus was not saying that, but here's what he was saying. John's baptism was a baptism unto repentance, okay? So in other words, you have got to change your position, you've got to change your condition, you've got to change your location so I can give you a new, yeah, y'all been paying attention. I like it. Okay. So, so that's what he's saying when he talks about this baptism. A repentance must take place, Nicodemus. You cannot stay where you are and go with me. Something different has to happen with you. So you need a change. You've got to resolve in your mind that I'm going to be different, that I'm going to change. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I want something fresh. Come on, say amen if you're here. So number one, he says, the water is symbolic of the repentance that must take place. Now here's the sweetness and the other part. The other part is once you repent and you invite me in, I come in. Spirit takes over. Y'all not going to like this message from here on out. Um, Because we still want to be in control. Born of water and born of spirit. Dichotomy exists there, okay? See, Nick, if you want to know how I'm able to do these things, it's because God is with. Yeah, come on, come on, come on, come on, talk to me. God is where? I'm almost done. He's there with me. He's there with me and he is in me, okay? So listen to what Jesus says. Some of your translation, flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. If you're going to resolve to change, marvel not, don't be shocked. you got to be born again of water and spirit so you can live. Now, in the flesh, I'm going to naturally do fleshly things. 
Come on, guys. All right. In the flesh, we will naturally do fleshly things. Listen carefully. It is impossible to do spiritual things in the flesh. You can't stay where you are and go with God. <laughs> it's impossible to do fleshly things, I mean spiritual things in the flesh. The transition must take place, and listen to this carefully, it is impossible to do fleshly things in the spirit. Y'all acting like Nicodemus now. How can these things be? <laughs> let, me, let me be simple. There is no way you can pray to God and sin at the same time. There's no way you can be in worship in the presence of God and sin at the same time. You have to leave one domain and go to the other and do you. And the problem with a lot of us is somehow we know how to sneak out and sneak in. <laughs> and I'm going to challenge you today to choose if you're going to change. Okay? Listen carefully. Walk in the Spirit, I said this Wednesday, and you shall not fulfill, this is Romans, the desires of the flesh, okay? Then I think there's another passage to talk about the desires of the flesh. You know, y'all know this, the fruits of the Spirit and all that good stuff is what happens in the Spirit. So if I'm walking in the Spirit and I've transferred into the Spirit, there is no way I can do earthly stuff. Let's be honest about it, okay? When I'm going off on my wife, it's because I have renounced, here how I'm going to say this, the spiritual things, and I've chose or chosen to allow my flesh to take over. When you give people a piece of your mind, matter of fact, we've got a church phrase for it when we're in the spirit and somebody makes us mad. I'm fitting to lay my religion down. You know? <laughs> I want to challenge you. Stop it. Stop it. Just say stop it. Okay. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. You've got to be born. There must be a repentance that must take place, and the Spirit of God must indwell you. So born again means that I turn away from my sin, from my frailty, from my shortcoming, and I invite the presence of God to come in me. Okay. Third thing real quick. There's a danger in that. When you allow God to come in, let me add this to it. If you surrender, God takes over. I'm almost done. When you allow God to come in, if you surrender, God takes over. Watch this, text. Watch this in the text. Here's this crazy analogy. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, the, Here Nicodemus, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. Let me stop. Here's what God is trying to say. And, and, and back in that day, they didn't have the little rooster with the egg sitting on top of the stick with the cup to catch the wind so it can turn around. Yeah, it's coming from the east today. No, it's coming from the earth. They had no idea because they didn't have the technology or none of that stuff to determine where the wind was coming from. So when the wind showed up, it just showed up. Are, are you hearing me? It just, so here's what Jesus is saying. You don't have no control of where the wind's coming from. You just stand there and it hits you and you don't know what happened or where it came from, but you hear it and, and you respond to it. And then watch the last phrase of that text. So is it with the Spirit. Oh, gosh, that's an important statement. Dang. That's an important statement. Look at this. So it is with everyone who is born of what? Spirit. Now, I'm going to land with this. I want you all to hear me. Because, well, let me say this first. If the Spirit of God is in me and I am resolving to change, God took the initiative to come meet me where I am, and he's trying to teach, teach Nicodemus now how to operate, how to function like him, how to be all that he would have him to be, and he's saying, Nicodemus, when God comes in, God takes over to the surrendered life. To the surrendered life. Come on, say, to the surrendered life. So, 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 so uh, I, want, I want to make sure I'm saying this as pointedly as I can. Because the issue with you and the issue with me is that we don't want God 
to take over because we like being in control. And if we're going to resolve the change, here's what I said, how I said it last week. The Spirit of God always speaks. We hear his voice. The issue comes down to are we going to obey him and do what he say do, or are we going to do what we want to do? Oh, come on, come on, come on. Let's be honest. We, let's be honest with ourselves, okay? The Spirit will take over, and, and, and what, what Jesus is trying to imply or say explicitly to, to Nicodemus, when I show up or when God shows up, you have no control if you're surrendered to me. So listen, I must surrender if I want to change. That's hard. Don't act holy on me. That's hard. Michelle, God will tell you don't argue with Gordon. And you can't tell God, shut up, I got this. And then you go argue with Gordon. That's what we do. That's what we do. We choose to disobey because we think we know more than God. And then here's the first thing. And then something worse happens. <laughs> know how we got here, but if you had shut up and that argument, we wouldn't have been here right now. Oh, I know how you got there. You didn't let God take over. <laughs> Don't act like it's just Katani and me, y'all. You know. <laughs> Scripture tells you slaves obey your masters. In other words, employee obey your employer. And boss leaves you may try to do something jacked up and get fired. Lord, I don't know why they fired. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Spirit spoke to you and you chose to disobey. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah, you do. Come on. Are you with me? Oh, oh. Don't, don't cheat on your wife. You go do what you do. Then you end up getting divorced or something crazy happened. I don't know what happened. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Yeah, we do. So here's what I'm trying to communicate, and I'm going to read the last part, and I'm going to stop. If we're going to resolve the change, it calls for a rebirth, repentance, inviting the Spirit to come in, and then allowing ourselves to obey the Spirit. Now watch this last thing, and I'm going to stop. So here's this long dissertation. Jesus goes in. Um, so Nicodemus said to him, how, verse 9, how can these things be, Nicodemus uh, said to him. Verse 10, Jesus answered, are you, and notice the proper article, the teacher of Israel. My translation said that. Some of your translation says Israel's teacher, but in the Greek, the article is there. This is why I said to you, Nicodemus was the man. He was the guy that was responsible are you with me? And, and let me give this away. I think Jesus' teaching took, because you'll notice that when, uh, Nic when Jesus died, Nicod when he was going through the, the, the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus was the one speaking up on his behalf. You'll also notice when they killed him, Nicodemus was the one that went with Joseph of Arimathea. To, come on, y'all know this. Come on, are you with me? So, so this thing took. Nicodemus listened, but here's what he said to him. You mean you're the big dog in Israel and you don't understand these things? What have you been teaching the people? You're responsible to properly exegete the text. Let me go here. And if you were to read from Genesis up until Malachi, it was all about God sending a Savior to come into the earth to save him. Come on, Nick, you saw this stuff. He even said the whole point of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness to save folk was the time going to come when I'm going to be placed on the cross and be lifted up. And you've been teaching this stuff, and all of a sudden I show up, and now I'm here. You don't know who I am. What's wrong? with you that's my problem I've been teaching it listening to it hearing it but I haven't been paying attention come on y'all come on come. last week he'd been hearing but he hadn't heard you're the teacher I mean come on and he says man if I told you earthly things were so and you don't believe it how can I tell you heavenly things Look at verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. The who? Moses. I mean, not Moses. 
Nicodemus, that verse. Do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're looking at the one that started out as God, that God incarnated into flesh to come and to save sinners like you and, and the whole Pharisaic and the Sadducean council. You're looking at the one who came, and if I started out with God, and I'm telling you, you must be born again, and you must be filled or indwelt by the Spirit, don't you think I know what I'm talking about? So here's the landing point. The issue for Nicodemus and the rest of the Sanhedrin and everybody else on the face of the earth it's not that they didn't hear or didn't know, but they didn't want to. Yeah, yeah. They didn't want to. That's hard. So here's how I started the series. If you're going to resolve to change, do you want to be healed? Do you want to change? Do you want to get to the place where God would have you to be? It's a want to. For the church people here, do you want to be filled with the Spirit so God can control your life? Because when you're filled with the Spirit, you're no longer in control. You have to obey what God say, do. Right? I was sharing with the men yesterday, and I shared with y'all. Um, Katani and I had a, a prayer point. Yeah, that meant argument. That's how preachers say it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was about the kitchen. And um, I like a clean kitchen. And I'm not saying my wife like a dirty chick kitchen, so don't nobody go tell her that. Um, <laughs> I like a clean kitchen. So... I'll wake up if it's not bad, and sometimes I'll be so angry, I clean it myself. Amen. Uh, there's all the women talking about the other cleaning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Y'all miss the point when I say I be so angry. It's not that I'm feeling spiritual. <laughs> See what I'm saying? You heard me, right? I'm so angry, I do it myself. Now, when I do it myself, I get angrier. Because if you mess it up, you kind of get what I'm saying? <laughs> and so I clean the kitchen, go to bed. Lord works on my heart and I feel good. Get up in the morning, kitchen dirty. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> Not cool. So I decide to confront her. Baby, didn't you see how spiritual I was when I cleaned the kitchen? <laughs> I had just made some coffee that morning. And I opened some Splenda, poured it into the coffee, and I left the Splenda packet on the counter. It didn't matter. Nothing else in that kitchen didn't matter. She pointed to the Splenda. <laughs> See, look at you. You're dirtying it too. Now, I'm not angry no more. I'm furious. Right? But listen to this. This is the funny part. The whole time God is talking, pick it up and walk away. Zip it up, pick it up, and walk away. Your past ain't all that spiritual. I looked at it for about five minutes. <laughs> the good news is I was quiet while I was looking at it. You're going to say something, you're going to say then I realized I had to preach today, and no, no, no. But then, then I, I realized that I have to make better choices and listen to the voice of God. You kind of get what I'm saying? So I heeded, I heeded. But what I learned in that is that I find it so amazing that in the little things, God is always talking. I'm saying that by way of good news. Come on, worship team, because I want you all to hear this. If you have been born again, the Spirit is already in you, 
and you can change if we resolve to listen to him. Come on, are you hearing me this morning? If we resolve to listen to him, we will be amazed at what God will do. So here's how our story is going to end. Felix, the things that I see you do, no one can do them unless God is with you. Same thing to you, church. The things that I see you do, no one can do them unless God is what? With you. Now, this is important because a lot of us are waiting for the heavens to open and the sky to drop down and some great momentous thing to happen in our life. And God is saying to you, I am speaking to you in the little things when people see your change and they see your behavior and they see you living a life after me. Here's what they're going to say the only way you're able to do that is because we know God is with you. Yeah. Yeah. God is with you. Amen. Funny story that I'm going to end. We went to a Muslim funeral yesterday. Quite interesting. That's another sermon illustration. So at the end of the funeral, my wife was so upset. She's going to say, I got dressed up. You're going to take me to dinner. And so this is after the splendor situation. So I'm in a spiritual mood. I took her to dinner. So I get to a um, nice steakhouse, we're dressed up, and I pull up to let her out. I'm thinking I'm going to be nice. I pull up to let her out of the car, and I'm looking at her. She's looking at me. <laughs> I'm like, a bunch of people come in. I'm like, <laughs> she's looking at me. <laughs> so I got out, went around, and opened the door. It gets worse. Then this couple that's walking, they're like, wow, gentlemen still exist in the world today. I'm like, no, they don't. She forced me. You know? <laughs> but you would be amazed, people, when we start to obey in the subtle things what we can change. Are you with me? I want to be a better husband to my wife. I want to be a better dad to my kids. I, I want y'all to hear me. I, I want to be a better grandparent to my grandkids. I want to be a better church member. I want to be a better representative of God in the earth. When people see me, I want them to say, God is with me. And when they see you, I want them to say, God is with you. As believers, you have the presence of God in you. Resolve to change. Resolve to change. Come on, stand to your feet.